Yeah, I really enjoyed the uh, talks earlier. Um, I don't have any tricks other than the one that I brought with me, which is at the end of this talk, I intend to perform magic, which is I intend to extend your thinking with my hands never leaving my arms. So if I accomplish that, I will have been successful. The other thing that I want to do is, seeing as I'm from Florida, I want to take credit for having brought this weather. Does this weather meet you? Because <laughs> otherwise, I was going to Skype it in. You know? In the old days, we used to call it mail it in, but this is TED, so we thought we'd take that approach. Um, let, me, let me talk about my, the key point is that innovation is a team sport. But before I get into this, let me talk about the background and how I got here. So the first thing is I grew up in Detroit, and I was really into Motown and cars. Now, anybody who comes from Detroit knows that cars isn't a big thing in Detroit anymore. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up, Detroit was the fourth largest city. Motown was huge. Neither of those are the case. And so it taught me that if you don't innovate, you die. So that became really important. And then I came to Purdue because I want to get my technical basis for engineering. And one of the things that happened is I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. This was back in the 60s. And I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. The good news is at Purdue, they have freshman engineering. So it doesn't make any difference what discipline you're in. You start out the same. Well, in 1969, the bottom fell out of the aerospace industry. I looked at the concept of being an unemployed 40-year-old engineer and thought, that's not a career path I want. So I changed to industrial engineering so that I could take and have a broad array of opportunities. That caused me to recognize that it really becomes important to understand what you're getting into, why, and what you're going to do with it. And from that created my direction and my career intent of making it better. From Purdue, I learned how important it was to make it better. I also learned how important math was. So can anybody tell me what one and one is? I'm sorry? It's 11, right? And so if you apply innovation correctly, 1 and 1 is not 2, it's not 3, it's 11. Okay? And so that's where I started. But as making it better, I also looked at how important it was to make people's lives better. And it's interesting, I ended up at Procter & Gamble because I liked the position that they had, what they were trying to do, even though they were making consumer products. And here is their motto, touching lives, improving life. And so I spent my next 30 years working in this arena. And then I retired. Not, OK. <laughs> I am not retired. I am still pursuing my passion of making it better. My passion, though, is to teach others how to make it better. And so when I get done here, you will have three principles that help you enable innovation, which I consider to be very important. Now, what is innovation? So if you go to Webster, you get that it's the introduction of something new, a new method, an idea, device. Interesting, what are we going to do with it? Well, I can tell you in my 30 years working for Procter & Gamble, I need a very different definition. I needed something that makes life better and makes money. Because it doesn't make any difference how good my ideas were. If it wasn't making money, we weren't doing it. The other thing that I learned is that it's a team sport. An individual can come up with an idea. An individual can come up with a concept. But in order for an innovation to happen, it takes a lot of people. And so how do you get a lot of people to take your good idea and move it forward? And so I can tell you that in my life at Procter & Gamble, I had a number of successes and also a greater number of learnings, which, by the way, is code word for not successes. Okay. I couldn't understand why all of my good ideas didn't get to market until I really understood these three principles. Now, importantly, you're told that you need to tell somebody something three times for it to sink in. Given this crowd, we're only going to do it twice. OK, so you'll get it. The first principle is to do something different. You have to do something different. OK, most people try doing different things by doing the same thing. The previous example we just had was wonderful. Pick something small, do it for 30 days, or don't do it for 30 days. Really make sure it's different. OK. The second thing is, different is not always better. But it is hard. And so one of the things you're going to learn is you better make sure that what you're doing is really different and is really better. Because however you go to do it, it's going to be hard. Why? People don't want to change. Okay? 
I am who I am. I don't want to change. I'd like a different outcome, but I don't really want to change. If I do want to change, I have to make a choice. The last thing is WIFM rules, critical pool. Okay, WIFM is not Nintendo and stereo. <laughs> it's what's in it for me. And so anytime you're working with somebody on innovation, you better be real clear what's in it for them. You know what's in it for you. You know why you're doing it. So when you're talking to a consumer about why your idea is a good idea, you got to be clear about what's in it for them. Okay? And you need to listen to them tell you what's in it for them. Because if you don't get their reality, you don't get it. It's not your reality accounts. It's everybody else's around you. And that's how you enable innovation, by understanding these three rules. So let me give you a quick story to put them all together. Through my many years of success, I was getting frustrated with the fact that, um, in fact, I was having some successes, some weren't. Being an engineer, I said, you know what, there's got to be a process that makes this better. And so I looked around, and I came across a man by the name of Clayton Christensen, wrote a number of books, Disruptive Innovation, and as I talked with him and his merry band at Innosite, I found that they had the principles, the theory, that made sense to me and fit my experience. So I combined with them to say, let's go to Procter & Gamble and see what we can do to change things. So the first thing we did was explain to the CEO what it was that we were going to do different. We were going to set aside a group that's going to work on this disruptive innovation using different processes that we have defined, different approaches, different metrics. And he said, very interesting. Why would I want to do that? With from rule number three, right? And so I said, because I promise you that if we do this, we will take the projects that we work on, we will cut the development time in half, we will cut the development cost in half, and we will quadruple the size of the project. Hmm, sounds better to me. OK, go ahead. What do you need? I said, I need four project teams to work with to demonstrate this, because quite frankly, we don't know if it really works. This is just our theory. OK, and so we then went off and got the four project teams, did the work, improved the process, made it run fundamentally better. And in the process, what we were able to do is show what worked for people, why it worked, and what they would get out of it. As a result, we now have a situation where P&G has what they call a disruptive innovation program in their NBC program that's designed to create new businesses. So they take the ideas, they put the teams together, they reinforce the teams to do the kinds of things that they need them to do in a different manner, and then execute this with some amount of success. How much success? Well, it was recently an HBR article that came out that now credits their innovation factory as producing three times the success rate that it had prior to putting this type of program in place. And so I just remind you the following. If you're going to do something different, you, you have to do something different. Whatever you do is going to be hard, so make sure it's really better. Because lots of, of us do things that are different, but they aren't really better. And the last thing is, when you're going to do it, you seldom do it alone. And so you must apply the WIFM rule to everybody with whom you are counting on and who you're engaging with. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day. <laughs>